when there's nothing hindering, nothing, no obstacles, no obstruction between us and his answer, us and his touch, us and his throne. I want to leave here with something. Amen. And it's available. It's up to us whether we receive it or not. Amen. In the right mind. We've got to be here with the right mind. In the right mind. Right focus. Right intentions. Amen. Let's do that for a moment. Amen. Look around. Take a lift inside you. Say, God, wash me of these spots and stains and blemishes and wrinkles and shortcomings and renew my heart within me. Create within me a clean heart. Oh Lord, this morning, let me receive what you have for me. Let me take what you've prepared for me. God, in Jesus' name, you're my Father, you're our Father, you're our Creator, and you know exactly what we need. And you know exactly when to apply those needs. If it's this morning, God, let it be so. It's all in your will, your way, your timing, all of it, God. We trust you. We ask God to have your way, your will be done. Not, let it not be me, but let it be you, God. This is your church. You're leading these people. You're leading us. And I give you your place, your position. We invite you this morning, God, walk among us and see us and check our hearts and our minds and remove any obstructions, remove any stains and spots and blemishes and wrinkles. Amen. Let us be revived and renewed in your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, God, you're good. You're always merciful and kind and patient. God, have your way and I give it to you. You be the speaker this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Get your name for a moment, amen. If you haven't already done so, just be friendly. Love one another. Amen. The Bible even says to love your enemies, love those that hate you, love those that, what does it say? Despitefully use you. Not only our brothers and sisters, that's easy to do, I believe. <laughs> to love your brother and sister, but then I see how brothers and sisters live with each other. They fight more than the average brother and sister, so. I welcome everybody this morning. It seems like it's been a while since we've gathered, amen. I hope you're reading your lesson. I hope you're reading your Bible. I hope you're fasting. Remember this year we're going to fast once a week. Any way you choose, whether it be all three days in one week or one day a week for three weeks. And last week being family week, however you choose to. Amen. But let's get that in our routine. Amen. Whatever it is you face and you struggle with. The Bible says some things are only removed and conquered by prayer and fasting. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Title of our lesson this morning is Feeding a City with a Sack Lunch. The truth about God says God provides for us out of His compassion. 
That's that agape love. That's that love that keeps giving even though we don't deserve it. That's compassion. You look beyond human inabilities, human weaknesses. It doesn't reward you based on what you've done, and what good you've said, what good you've done. Compassion overrides all of that and just looks at you through eyes of love. That's a godly kind of love, an agape love, a compassionate love. Amen. For some of us, we need to learn that compassionate heart. We get upset and hurt and for every little tiny thing, and that ought to let us know, hey, my love isn't what it should be. It's not aligned with the Bible. I don't love, if we don't love like God loves, then we need to correct the kind of love we think we may have, right? Amen. That's the truth about God. Truth for my life says I will worship God for who He is. Not just for what He does. That's compassionate love in return to God. You don't love Him based on what He's doing for you, what He's done for you. You don't offer your love and your services, your work and your duty based on what He's done for you. You don't, you don't gauge God like that. That shouldn't, that shouldn't even be done. Amen. God is God and He is King of kings. He's Lord of lords. Alpha. He's the creator of everything that we can't even imagine sometimes. And who are we to think that He deserves this much? Or only at times, in certain times, but no. He deserves love, attention, praise, honor, glory. No wonder the elders in heaven worship Him, bow down to Him and love Him 24 hours a day. Hallelujah. If only we would get in that mindset, that frame of mind throughout the day, every moment, every second, every time we move, every time we stir, every time anything, just to give Him thanks. Thank you, Lord. How many of you do that throughout your day? Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, I know it was you. Whatever may happen or you get a flat tire, thank you, God. I know it was for a reason that you were detect or deflected me from something down the road. Thank you. Thank you. I lost my wallet this week. I know. Thank you, Lord. If I had my wallet, I'd be spending all my paycheck if I had my... Lord knows. Amen. In the story today, if we would turn, we'll walk down through the scripture and we'll get to our, our focus verse and verse 14. But I want to just look, look through this chapter. It's a very short story. Only 14 verses. The Bible says, feeding the 5,000. John chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, and after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him. Why did they follow him? Because they saw his signs. There's yeah, so much info right there. Signs. You and I are to be looking for signs, right? Notice these signs. I've set these signs. I've set you warnings. I've set you look around and see and see all these signs and know that I am coming. When parents or when kids are unruly to their parents, when there's disobedience, when there's lawlessness, when the world thinks an opposite, when they call good bad and bad good, and when they call white black and black white, 
These are signs that let you know that I am coming and not to be getting ready, but to be ready. Amen. They followed him because they saw his signs. And what are those signs? He was out there loving people. He was out there talking to people. He was out there testifying to people. He was out there encouraging people. He was out there praying for people. He was out there healing people. He was out there making an impact on his community. He was out there reaching out to the lost. He was out there sitting down with the hurting, with the empty, with, with those that are empty, that are down and out. He, he was out there sitting with the alcoholics and the drug addicts. That's when they said, hey, there's something about this and he must be God. He must be the one that we are expecting. He must be the Messiah. They saw his signs proving that he was God, proving that he had a prayer life, proving that he was from the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God set by the Father from above. Everybody saw it. Everybody knew it. What kind of signs are following you this morning? I said it repeatedly last few Sundays. People are going to want what you have. People are going to be drawn to a people that know how to love. People are going to follow people that know how to forgive. People are going to follow people that care about them, willing to sit down and spend time with them. People are going to follow a people that have the truth, that know the truth, that live by the truth. People are going to follow someone who would listen to them, who would testify to them, who would encourage them, who would lift them up. <clears throat> That's why he had a great following. They wanted more of what he had. They wanted to hear more. They wanted to see more. They wanted to experience more. <clears throat> and they wanted to feel that something again. Ooh, what a testimony. That's what we as a church ought to strive for. That's what we as Ecclesia Saints ought to shoot for in our lifestyle, the way we live. People should be drawn to who we are and what we are about. They should be drawn by the words that we speak. They should be drawn to us by the love and the character that emanates and glows and flows from within us. People should want more of what we have. People should feel that presence around us when they come near to us. They should just feel that love pouring out from within us. And that's why people thronged him. A great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. A lot of times Christians only want friends who are you know, at their level. Yeah, but they don't dress like we do. They don't talk like we do. They don't know what we do. We're, we're better than them. Somewhere in, the, in their mind, they're actually thinking those thoughts. 
How do I know that? Because they don't, they don't want to sit down with the alcoholics. Because they stink. They start cursing and cussing and causing a scene. They, they don't want to be near that. They don't want to be around that. I'm better than that. I, I don't think God's called me to talk to that. Uh, they're not going to hear me anyway. They're not going to respond anyway. Whatever the excuse is, <clears throat> that they're that diseased. They have something that they're trying to get rid of. They have something that they're bound by. They have something that's holding them down in a jail cell, imprisoned by some kind of infirmity, some kind of trouble, some kind of sickness, some kind of a disease, but yet we're too proud we overlook. I can't go near that. They stink, they're drunk, they're dirty, they have a change, they have a shower. They... Drug addicts, all different kinds of people that are sick in their mind, sick in their heart. Many people have been, they may not have alcohol, drug problems. Other people have other deep-seated issues and troubles in their life. Traumas that they've experienced when they were children and they're still struggling with it. They may not think with the way we do. They may not have an outlook like we do. They may not look, they may not have the same vision, the same outlook, the same love, the same purpose. They may not be on our, at our level, in our clique. So we judge them and say, I'm that's not for me. We can't be that way. How dare we be that way? We are called to save and reach the lost. We are called those that are out on the byways, the highways, the diseased, the sick, the oppressed, those that have infirmities and troubles and hindrances in their lives. They need help. They're reaching, they're calling people, but yet we walk by without care or concern. But Jesus knew. How did He know? Because He had a life of prayer. The Spirit within Him said, hold on a minute. Somebody in this area, somebody in this street, somebody just pulled virtue from me. Who was it? That's what a prayer that prayed up life will do. It'll cause you to be sensitive to those that are around you. you. People may not sit down with you and tell you all their problems, but the Spirit somehow, that still little voice inside of you is going to say, hey, that person needs prayer. Hey, take a moment with that brother, that sister, and just, just sit down with them. Just talk with them. Befriend them. That's, how we, that's why prayer is important. It, it helps our spiritual ears open up. It, it opens our spiritual eyes and helps us to see and hear and notice. But if we don't have an ounce of prayer in our lives, we won't be able to see, we won't be able to hear, we won't be able to feel, we won't be able to contact anybody, we won't be able to know who's having issues and trouble and who needs us. Hallelujah. Verse 3. And then Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. I wonder what they talked about. I mean, they're healing people by the hundreds and thousands and people all around him. And somehow, him and his disciples managed to escape and make their way up a mountain. And there they sat down. What a place to go, right? Up a mountain? You'd think you'd go to a hideaway, hideout, a garage, or a living room somewhere. Up a mountain? And you sit there with your di disciples. What do you think they talked about there? 
What do you think? Who, who do you think did all the talking there? The disciples or Jesus? That's all up, up to you. But I think the main point here is that sometimes we need time to step back, step out of this overly busy, shoulder to shoulder, time stealing stuff. Television, friends, job, extracurricular activities, friends, the list goes on. They steal 90% of our times. Sometimes we need to unplug ourselves from all that chaos. You know you need it sometimes. Even in your own house where it should be peaceful and calm. Sometimes there's more trouble in your household than any other place. You need to unplug yourself sometimes from your own brothers, sisters, or whoever it is, your friends, your friend, your circle of friends, your television, your social media, your cell phones, whatever takes all of your time, all of your attention, everything that you spend a majority of your time doing. Sometimes we just need to go up into a mountain and just sit there, you and him alone with God. Let Him bring you back to that place and say, hey, remember your goals? Remember these promises that you said? Remember your future goal? Remember your long-term goal? Remember your short-term goals? He'll bring you back to reality. And you'll get all uncluttered and refocused. Spending time with the Lord by yourself helps you to prioritize, to reprioritize and help you to see clearly once again and to be realigned and refueled and re-energized and my, my talking to somebody this morning you need that reviving you need that refueling you need that re-energizing you need that re-strengthening you need that realignment, that reprioritization, that reorganization in your life. Everything's cluttered, overwhelmed by everything. You need to step away, make your way where you're just you and God for a set time. Verse 4, and now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Turns to Philip. Maybe Philip's the number cruncher. Maybe, uh, I don't know why, maybe he was just, just happened to be standing there. But Philip, Jesus says, hey, where shall we buy? I better not. I'm going to reread that. Where shall we buy bread? Jesus already knew. In fact, I think he does say that. Verse 6. But this he said to test him. For he himself knew already what he was going to do beforehand. But just to test Philip, he says, where shall we buy bread? Notice what he said, where. It's like already he knew it was going to happen. He already knew he was going to feed. He already had a plan. He already saw it. But his question was to simply, where, do we, where shall we get the bread from? Where? Not how. He didn't ask how shall we get the bread, but where. 
In other words, he's kind of saying, who is going to supply the bread? How many of us are like Philip? We automatically whip out our purse or whatever you have here. I wallet, your debit card, you scroll down to your bank account, and then you make your decision. I can't give twenty dollars. Well, according to my bank account, I can't. I don't have any money. We don't have any money. We look at our money. That's exactly what Philip did. He says, Lord, we only have 200, what is it, denarii? That's eight months' wages. We don't have that money. We don't have any money, Lord. When all the while he's been with Jesus and he's performing miracles on top of miracles, un unexplained, un unthought of, unheard of miracles, after miracle, I mean, he's the one that rained bread down from heaven. He knew who Jesus was. He knew who he was following. But how could Philip not have noticed and seen who Jesus was at that point? Does that sound like a lot of you? We've been with Jesus for so long. We walked with Jesus for so long. We've heard stories. We've heard preaching. We've heard teaching. We've heard lessons. We had Bible study after Bible study, prayer meeting after prayer meeting, but we still doubt what God can do. Like Philip, we look at our money, <clears throat> we look at our talents, can you teach, can you do whatever you think, I can't, I'm too afraid, I can't do it right now, I need more time, I need more teaching, I need more training, I need, we go to our talent and we're like, ah, uh, I'm not qualified. We go to our talents. We go to our, 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 our time. We go to our time. Are you able to give a Bible or whatever, to spend time with it or reach out? I don't have time. I, I work full-time job outside of church. I work full-time for the church. I, I have kids. I have a wife. I have a home, I have duties, a honeydew list around the house, which is longer than any other list ever. I have this to do, I've got oil chains, I've got my kids, I've got my son, I've got, I got my job, I've got this. We go to our time and we say, I don't have time to do that. What do you look for when you're asked to when the Lord asks you a question, what's your response? Is it, I don't have time? Is it, I don't have talent? Is it, I'm not able to? I'm not ready? I'm too small? I'm just a babe? I'm just a baby? I'm not having matured yet? I'm not having arrived yet? What, do you, what would you say? I know what a lot of you have already said. Amen. But we evaluate ourselves through the eyes of, I can't. Or maybe through the eyes of intimidation or fear or whatever. But we evaluate ourselves and we're like, nope, we can't do it. But church, the mission is great. Our mission is great. Our mission is so great that we can't allow us to say, I can't do it. I don't have time. I'm unable to. I'm not talented enough. I don't have the, the voice. I don't have the training. I don't have the teaching. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have what it takes. Amen? 
verse 7. And then Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. In verse 8, and one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, I like this part. Verse 9, it says, There is a lad here, or there is a young boy here, who has five barley loaves and two small fish. I mean, it's nice enough for Andrew to, to notice and consider this young boy and, you know, kind of present him before the Lord. But look right after, he's like, but he's nothing. He doesn't have much. Kind of what he said. <clears throat> Where was I at? Uh, There's a lad here. It's five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. <clears throat> Let me stop that there for a moment. There's this young boy there with bread and fish. Remember the story of Esther? You know how every, every tiny, small detail of everybody in that city had to be there at the right time. Everybody was on perfect time. God was orchestrating everybody in that city, in that land, in the high official chamber, in the king's mind, the servant's mind, the, the everybody. They didn't even know that they were being used of God, being led by God, but at the end, the whole story wrapped up proving that God has control of every situation in every part of our lives to have whatever it was written in the king's book and to be hidden away in the cellar and then to be brought out at a certain time and to be read before the king and the king to remember it. all of this if you look at it that's impossible for things to happen it's not just happenstance it's God in control of everything. Exactly the same here with this young boy. And he just happened to be standing there with a loaf of five loaves of bread and two fish. And Andrew notices him. This young lad didn't have a name. Still went on to be unknown unnamed, just a young boy, just a nobody, just a, an insignificant stand bystander. He doesn't have much. He's only got a few slices of bread and two fish. Nothing great. That's what Andrew thought. But God saw something totally, completely different. He looked on that young boy. He may have had a little something. He may have had a little sack lunch. But he had something in him. He had a hold of something in his heart and his life. He had something. Andrew probably saw, like the Bible says, a mustard seed. But you and I know that mustard seed has great potential, right? If you use right, if applied right, if watered right, if prayed about right, if we know what it's capable of, the mustard seed. Hallelujah. You know, that might have been said about some of us right in the beginning. When you were maybe a new convert, new to the church, and 
you know, first time in church, somebody just saw you as a, a young lad, young person, and young up and coming, and you know, there's really not much to be used there. Just you know, you, you have you don't have much. You have a little bit. Maybe that's what we think of ourselves sometimes. I don't have that much. I, I have nothing. That's what my excuse was in the in the beginning. Well, I can't because I was raised like this. I was born like this. I have this. I have nothing like this and that. I had a good list of being a nobody. I had a good list of negative uh, things about myself. But you know, somebody had to look on me and somebody had to look on me through the eyes of faith and say, hey, there's some potential in you. Hey, there's something good in you. Amen. And I'm glad that the Lord and my wife saw those things and maybe others in the church, maybe uh, my bishop, or they saw something, a quality within me and they began to use that and build on that and I was willing enough to say yes I'll learn I'll grow I'll do this I applied myself and and here I am thank God he's a merciful God a, a patient God a loving God a, a temperate God a, a long-suffering God amen But you know what? We say this all the time. It doesn't matter how small or how low you start out. Just like the story here. We may have a little, but that little is huge. Becomes huge when given to God. When as small and as little as, and as insignificant you think you are, you give yourself, you put yourself in the trust and in the hands of God and see how He can multiply you and see how He can bring the increase. Isn't that what the Bible says? It says He brings the increase, not us. If we would just fall into His hands, if we would just trust Him, if we would just put all our strength and all our might into following Him and serving Him and being obedient in every which way we know to be right, the Lord will be gradually begin to help us mature and grow into what He wants us to become. Amen? Every single one of us, church, we all have something in us that God wants to use to reach maybe hundreds, maybe thousands like this little boy. God wants something, that small talent, that small ability, that small knowledge that you have, something inside of you if we would just give it to the Lord, through that one thing, there is no telling how many people you can reach and how many people you can encourage, how many people in your community, in your home, in your workplace, in your job site that you can affect and have an impact on. Hey Amen, what a story. We all have great potential, every single one of us. Look at your neighbor and just look at the potential just sitting there. Go ahead, take a look, see who your neighbor is. You just think, wow, you, you've got great potential. I see great things in your life. I see you as a, amen. And we got to bring out these these qualities in each other to nurture each other and to help each other. Amen? Yeah. Verse 9. There's a lad here who's five barley loaves, two fish, 
But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Notice that's only 5,000 men only. Fathers, brothers, men. But if you consider everybody, men, women, children, teenager, elderly, whoever, 15 to 20,000 people in that meeting right there. Not just 5,000, but and Jesus said, how all these sit down? And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. See something here. And the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Do you know something here? How did the bread and the fish continue to multiply? What happened? Where did it come from? How did it feed so many people? Anybody want to guess where it came from? It came from when they were all working together in one mind, in one accord, in unity. That multiplying came when they learned how to give of themselves, not selfishly, but they had, they were in one mind, one accord, they gave, they freely. We read it. Jesus took it, gave thanks, and then he gave it to, he gave it to his disciples. Then his disciples were giving it, and then they shared it among themselves. They were just giving of themselves and giving and giving. The Bible says when they stopped giving, the multiplying stopped, the bread stopped, the fish stopped. That reminds me of that story in the Old Testament. Remember the lady with the, the vessels? The Lord told them, gather as many vessels as you, you're able to get and start pouring oil into those vessels. And she gathered, I don't know how many jars of oil, and she began to pour oil and oil. And she started feeling it. And, not, and she just kept pouring. She kept what she had that. And she kept pouring as long as she kept pouring into those vessels. That oil just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. It was until she stopped pouring herself out. It was when she stopped giving of herself, her talents, her money, her work, her energy, her all herself. That's when things stopped moving. That's the, that's when things became came to a standstill. Some of us need to get back up and start moving again and start giving of ourselves. It's not over until the Lord calls us up into heaven. We're not done until the Lord calls us. We're not done until we're done, until we're unable to move and function. Our work is not over until He comes. Hallelujah. Some of us need to get back up and pick up our work and pick up our promises and pick up our vows and say, hey, where did I leave off that? I want to continue giving to myself, giving to my energy, giving to my support, giving to my time, giving to my prayers, giving to whatever I have. I may not have much, but such as I have, I'll give it to you. My talents, my wisdom, my knowledge, whatever, God, I'm here. How can I be used? I mean, I have much, but I'm going to give a little bit into the offering plate. I mean, I have money. I'm going to give myself the time to help out with the men's ministry and do some construction work or reach out or give a bite. 
we got to learn how to start giving of ourselves and the most important part, working with one another. In one mind, we can't be two separate entities. We're trying to make this thing happen. We've all, we've all got to be focused in one mind, right? As brotherly, sisterly. Love. Woo, hallelujah, what a lesson. Verse 12, so when they were filled, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing's lost. And therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. And then those men whom they had seen the sign that Jesus did and said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Hallelujah. You know, when we start to give, what happens? The Lord begins to give. Remember the Bible that says, whatever you measure out, whatever you need out, whatever you sow, the increase comes from Him. When we learn how to give, and when we learn how to give of ourselves, the Lord begins to move. He begins to give. He begins to pour out. The Lord, once the Lord begins to give, be like Moses, hey, you're giving too much, you need to stop. Once we learn to give, the Lord is begins giving to us. And it doesn't stop until we stop. How many of you have stopped? How many of you are willing to restart this morning? There's a whole community looking at us, church. We've got to be the church. We've got to be the one with the answer. We've got to be the one with the plan this end time. But you know what, church? I'm going to end with this. But we as a little church, we as a small church, we can make an impact on this whole area by the little that we have. We don't have to be a grand facility. And the little that we have, we can make a huge impact, just like this story today. We can reach a city by what's in your little sack lunch this morning. We can feed a city that is hungry and thirsty for something that is real. If we do our part, church, the Lord is for sure to do his part. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I pray that you do your part this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Think back what has God has done for you in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. He's never failed. Anybody, amen, hallelujah. He's always been there, amen, hallelujah.